I'm from the University of Oldenburg, uh, as usual, tell a little bit about the history of Christoph. So in 1992, he did his PhD at the University of Göttingen in physical chemistry, and he was studying uh, the isomerization reactions in motor beams. And then he went to Caltech, to the group of Zewell, and did femtochemistry from 1992 to 1994. And then he returned to Berlin in the Max Born Institute and shifted gears completely, working on nanoptics. And let's say that's basically from where he evolved in the field. So for the moment, he's uh, studying uh, all type of systems where there is a strong interaction of light with, uh, with excitations in the materials be it uh, plasma polaritons or crystal uh, polaritons and polarons. And, uh, well, you see the title of his talk and he will explain the rest of the world in the coming hour. Okay. So, thanks, Daniel, and thanks to you for, for being here. It's a pleasure to be here and just be here. I understand that basically very few people of you have a background in ultra-fast optics, right? Yeah. So I will try my best to explain a little bit what we're doing and why we're doing it. Yeah. In case that it gets too technical, please just simply feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, so, well, usually we use light to see things. Yeah. So we, we take microscope, we look through the microscope and we observe. And the idea is not to perturb the system that we want to look at. Yeah. Um, in optics, we're trying just to basically transcend this paradigm. We're trying to make fluctuations of the light field, vacuum fluctuations of the light field so strong uh, that the coupling of matter to light will dominate the properties of, of matter. Uh, so we, we're just trying to look at it from the other side. Uh, you may be aware of uh, research that is going on since quite a long time on uh, putting, for example, um, quantum emitters into cavities uh, in order to induce polaritons, in order to use, induce polariton condensation, bosine shine condensation, superfluidity or so. Um, that's usually stuff, usually stuff that is going on at low temperatures. We're trying to make these, these interactions so strong uh, that they dominate properties also at room temperature, which is, um, of course, interesting for, for uh, device applications. Yeah. Um, so, there are seven people in the moment, including us, who are trying to understand uh, how properties of molecules or of solid state system change when you basically drive them strongly with fluctuations of light fields. Uh, so that's, that's the main topic. Uh, there, there's ideas that you can change chemical reaction dynamics. Uh, so you, you take molecule. Uh, put it into a cavity, let the, the cavity be bounce back and forth and make the cavity resonant to a molecular vibration. So in essence, yeah, you do no longer do material synthesis in the way that you're used to it, yeah, where, where basically a certain material has a certain number of vibrational degrees of freedom, of on or so on, they're just matter given, you have to change the structure of matter. Yeah. Now we're changing the environment, and we're using this to, to add additional degrees of freedom. Yeah? And the idea behind this is very, very simple. Uh, we are all making use of this in the moment since we're still breathing oxygen. Oxygen is a molecule. Oxygen knows as a molecule about strong coupling because basically you have two oxygen uh, atoms and you have an electron tunneling all the way between them. And this forms new molecular states. And obviously we, we, we live reasonably well in the moment, some of you, yeah. <laughs> because these molecular states are not the same as the atomic state. Okay, So there, in molecular physics, this is very well known. Uh, yeah. But in solid state uh, physics, this is a little bit of a change in paradigm uh, for very simple reasons. Because in solid state environment, in particular at room temperature, we were facing decoherence. Yeah. So decoherence is basically killing this coherent coupling of uh, between neighbors. Yeah? It's killing uh, the, the ability to alter properties beyond 
they behave in time. It restricts sort of like these, these wonderful uh, opportunities that, uh, say, condensed metaphysics or molecular physics, quantum engineering gives you. It restricts them, yeah, because the, the coherence properties are ubiquitous and very, very fast, depending on a few of them to second time scale. This is why also here I saw many people going to low temperatures in order to just yeah, uh, do the simple trick yeah, and uh, just cool down uh, the environment so that it's not having basically enough power uh, to, to kill the physics. Yeah? And so again, we're trying to overcome this by making interactions so strong that even at room temperature, we can add the properties of, of matter uh, by coupling to the, to the light field. And um, specifically, uh, there's research going on where we're not only trying to do this in ensemble of emitters uh, that we couple to light fields, but we're also trying to, to reach this ultimate goal of ha having a single two-level system that couples to a single cavity of, of, a, of a photon field uh, to get strong coupling there. And there's many debates about whether this is good to do with plasmonics or not good with plasmonics because you have matters and losses, etc. Yeah. But um, you have uh, an interesting field uh, that combines excitons and plasmons. It's very active in the moment. And the idea behind this is that just matters allow you to confine light so, so nicely uh, to few nanometer spatial dimensions or even atomic spatial dimensions uh, that this localization of the light field making the mode of the light field will necessarily enhance the quantum fluctuations of the light field. Because if you look a little bit into how uh, zero-point energy fluctuations scale, they scale with the square root, one over the square root of the volume of the mode, the electric field amplitude proportional to one over the square root of the volume. So making the volume small, this is the same as making basically the, the shaking force is very, very strong, and thus there's two opposing regimes. One that uses big cavities with very high quality factors, long coherence time, yeah? and there's another nanoscale machinery in a sense that tries uh, to squeeze light <coughs> into such small volumes yeah? that these, this enhances the, the cavity factor. So that's a little bit of the scenery, yeah. And there's plenty of experiments in the moment that probe strong couplings between light and matter. And usually what they're doing is relatively straightforward. They measure light scattering spectra, they measure fluorescence, they probe the linear optical properties of these systems. Um, okay. Again, a bit of background, so if you do linear optics, you're in a slight problem because you can never, you, you have one photon that interacts with the system, yeah? and this one photon can not tell you usually whether your particle is a classical particle or quantum particle. You cannot distinguish between classical particles, classical oscillators, bosons, or fermions simply because you cannot see the quantum correlations with just photo, one photon. So you need nonlinear spectroscopies to get access to many body interactions. Yeah? So you would not be able in such linear optical experiments to tell apart whether this, this is a quantum particle or uh, whether this is just the classical set of harmonic oscillator. And therefore, one wants to do, go beyond uh, experiments that are currently done in the field uh, that use the simplest of all methods that is like linear spectroscopy. Yeah. And that's why we are interested in this. And since we are from ultra fast optics, um, what we're doing is very, very simple. We take short light paths. We use this light path as a hammer yeah, to yeah, impulsively kick on the pendulum. And then, then we just take photographs of the motion of the pendulum. Yeah? And if we have two, two pendula, then what we are interested in seeing are rubber oscillations. We are interested in seeing how energy is flowing from one quantum system to the other and back. 
in order to make sure that we are indeed probing strong coupling phenomena because this periodic energy exchange is essentially the, the yeah, Drosophila motion that underlies quantum coherent yeah. And now comes the problem. Yeah. So in these systems at room temperature, in these strongly coupled exciton plasmon coupled systems, for example, um, we have coherent energy exchange um, phenomena that persist for a few tens or maybe a hundred femtoseconds or so. Yeah. And you want still to see oscillations on top of this, so you best better have short passes in a laboratory or you do other indirect experiments. But if you want to see this in real time, yeah, then you best basically work, and this, that's why we're doing it, with short passes. Okay, so much for motivation. Yeah. So we, we are just interested in watching YouTube. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So here, you have seen like everything that comes now, more or less, yeah. Um, yeah. because that's that's what we're interested in. We're interested in seeing many body interactions in in, in quantum systems. Yeah. And here you have seen, in, or maybe you have not, we have seen maybe impulsive interaction, the impulsive excitation of the system. So take a look here. You will see a finger coming, yeah. and this finger, chuck. Yeah, kicks on one on of the pendula. Yeah? So when you want to do the experiment, you need to make sure that you're not exciting an eigenstate of the system, but a coherent superposition of eigenstates of the system, which then sort of evolve in time and give you quantum learning. Okay? Everything can be seen on YouTube for you this okay? or ask your theoretician friends. Yeah? Good. So much for the physics motivation. And uh, now comes a little bit of an advertisement. It will get a bit complicated now. Uh, also, here there are people doing some probe experiments. So they're sort of taking one pulse, or maybe a push pulse also, I heard this. Uh, and then taking a second pulse, called probe pulse, to interrogate the system. We're not doing this. We are using a sequence of two pump pulses in a technique that is called two-dimensional or multi-dimensional electronics just What's the point? So if you have two passes, you have sort of like two electric fields, okay? And these electric fields can interfere. Well, because it's electric field, okay? Uh, so you can have constructive or destructive in, uh, interference in the time domain, yeah? So you can strengthen or weaken the pulse just because you have like two waves that, that overlap, fine. Yeah? And you can control this overlap, this, this coherence, very nicely by taking an interferometer. This interferometer can delay uh, the, the two pulses relative to each other. Yeah? And so in the time domain, you have a degree of freedom, which is the time delay between the pulses. Okay? Now, I want you to ask you to switch on your Fourier transformers. Yeah. So if you have these two short electric fields in the time domain, time delayed by some variable time delay tau, how does this look like in the spectral domain? It's a frequency cone. It's yeah. So you have a short pulse in the time domain. Okay, so that means this short pass is very, very broad, covers very many wavelengths. Okay, yeah. and now you have a second of this, and you have a double slit experiment in the time domain. And if you look at the double slit pattern be behind the double slit, yeah, you see the spatially modulated spectrum, and that's exactly what you see here in the spectral domain. Okay, still, still with me? Okay. If it's too simple, I speed up, uh, no problem. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? But this, this point, I want you to get it, okay? So, now imagine that you have a quantum emitter sitting somewhere at some energy position because it has a certain color, yeah? because it's a quantum dot that sits there or so. Yeah? Now, you can decide about whether you want to excite this, this system or not by moving this time knob here, 
Okay. Uh, so you can time shift this time delay, and then you can like bring either constructive interference, you can create constructive interference here, or destructive interference by just having a tiny few uh, um, fractions of a micron shift in the time delay between the two. So let me see if I understand. I'm going to call it analogy because it's still. Uh, but that's, so if I change the, change the distance between them, that's basically changing this, the uh, double slit right. distance, right? So that changes the, the width of, of the column. No. Okay. It changes the spacing. That's what I mean. Yeah, sorry, spacing. But yeah. if I now change the phase of one of these pulses, that would be. That I can use to shift the entire spectrum sideways. No. So here, that's your that's your pulse. It contains a few cycles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you have an envelope in the in the time domain. Let's say uh, ten femtoseconds, three cycles. Fine. Yeah. So this decides how many colors are included in this burst. Yeah. So you have a sound burst. Yeah. And this sound burst, if it's short, contains a broad spectrum. So this envelope is what is given by how short you can make your pulse. Okay. Now, if you change the delay or the phase or so, what you change is the internal structure, not the overall structure. Yeah? And thus, you can shift this pattern. Okay. The, the envelope remains the same. Yeah? Okay. Thanks for the question. Clear? Yeah? Okay. So now, you can, so here, that's your pump pulse there. You, you do a pump pulse experiment here, and you probe here. So this pump pulse there changes somehow the optical properties of your system, okay? And you monitor this as a function of the time delay T, the waiting time between this pump pulse there and this, this uh, probe pulse. The probe pulse just inter interrogates. Yeah. And now, you repeat these pump probe experiments many, many times, but with this different time delays tau. Okay? And that means that this pattern, which is seen by this quantum emitter, changes on and off. Okay? And the time delay that you need to go from constructive to destructive interference depends on the color of the emitter. So if you put the emitter here, you will see a modulation from on and off. Uh, but it, another time period, okay? So when you have such a set of pump probe spectra as a function of this coherence time tau, yeah, you can just simply do another Fourier transform and you get a two-dimensional spectrum, okay? If it's too complicated, don't worry, you can just look at the maps that you take you get now, yeah, and you can think about them, but at least uh, I had this didactic idea that I sort of tried to, to get this across. Yeah. So you create what is called a two-dimensional electronic spectrum. Yeah. So you perform, you measure how the optical excitation changes the signal, the, something at the signal frequency, at the detection frequency, at the probe frequency, yeah. at a certain fixed waiting time, yeah? and now this fluid transform along this coherence time gives you a second excitation axis. Yeah? And you may say, so what? Uh, we can also just do, like, we take the color, a uh, narrowband laser, and we excite and probe with another color, that's the same thing. Mm -hmm. No way, because then you have you lose time resolution because you need a narrow band pulse, and the narrow band pulse has no time resolution. So here you may, you get time and energetic information about the excitation process, and I find time resolution that's important. Good. So this this uh, signal frequency axis that's recorded by simply dispersing the protein and exactly. Yeah, so you have the detection frequency, that's your normal spectrometer. Yeah, but here you have new access, that's the excitation frequency. Okay, good. So now, that's the new, yeah. I don't really understand why you couldn't just use a, like a femtosecond laser for some excitation. 
so much. I could, but I would like to care. If I, yeah, all of you are different. So, <laughs> if I take a short pass, to impulsively I excite all of you, how the hell would I know to whom I talk? Yeah? And all of you will start to move. Like I could never figure out to whom of you I am talking. So I need an additional information so that I see you individually. Yeah? So in case that the two of you now start to talk to each other and exchange energy, yeah, I want to see that I excite you yeah? and that you sort of catch up the energy at some point later. And if I just had one pipe, I could never do this because all of you would be, would sort of uh, move in complete async to me. Yeah? And I would have to figure, figure out from just the color, yeah? like how the internal motion is. Yeah? I could not. So that's the external degree of freedom that is important. Okay? Yeah? And I will carry you through the map. Yeah? So, I will never get to experiments, but it doesn't matter. Okay, good. Yeah. So we have what we know is, is the density matrix. Yeah. So we have different quantum states here in the room. Yeah. And now I can I can basically decide yeah, to whom I talk. Yeah. And if you are isolated yeah, and just change your own property, yeah, I will see excitation at your color and detection at your color. Okay. If I decide to talk to you, yeah, you will have a different energy, and I will see that. Okay? But now it could be that I excite you, yeah, and you transfer your energy to you. Yeah? Yeah? So you send her a letter or something, okay? Yeah? <laughs> then optical excitation of him yeah, would change her optical properties. Okay? And I would see this very nicely. Yeah? I would see this because now I have an off-diagonal peak here. Yeah? I excite at your color, yeah? but I see a change at your color. Okay? Good. Yeah? There could also be the other process. So I could excite you, yeah? and you change him. Yeah? And this is on the other side of the diagonal. Okay? And so that's beautiful because now yeah, I can see the inner workings of the system. Okay? Yeah. I, unfortunately, I did not invent the technique, uh, so, so, but that otherwise is very nice. Yeah. There's one more thing, then the, the general introduction is over. Yeah. So, let us assume that your exchange is unidirectional. Yeah. So, you give something to her, and she keeps it, yeah, and never returns it back, yeah. or the other way around, yeah, not, yeah, to get into trouble with. <laughs> <laughs> with anything, yeah, yeah, fine. That would mean that exciting you would change her state, but not exciting her would change your state, okay? So I only see one of these peaks. So if I upconvert, I excite the lower energy state and see high energy, yeah? If the other way around, if I lose energy, then I excite high energy and it goes down. Yeah? So I can see this incoherent flow of energy. Okay? But there could be the other thing, that this thing that we're interested in, that we now excite you, yeah? you transfer energy back and back and back and back, yeah? and then we see these two peaks. So from that we can see, yeah? we can see, we can distinguish between coherent and inner incoherent energy. And there's one thing that is hidden here that's another degree of freedom. We can also change the time delay between these two excitation pulses and the profiles. Okay? And that's the super coolest thing of all. Yeah? Because now, yeah? so now, yeah? you start, yeah? and initially this does not change you. Yeah? And then after some time, yeah, the energy is with you, and your state is changed. So how will this pop up? All these states as a function of will, will start to blink. Yeah? All of these states will start to blink because there's a quantum interference pass hidden in the diagram. Yeah? And so we have a tool, a wonderful tool, 
yeah, that has can be used to distinguish between strong coupling and weak coupling, yeah, between just incoherent energy flow and the physics that we are after. Yeah. And I, I found this so super surprising that I worked very hard on my find my people to try to do some experiments about it, even though uh, nature and science told us that they won't, don't want to publish this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share that I can see. Yeah. So, yeah. Good. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is super old yeah? because every uh, garden variety organic chemist is doing this already uh, since the 90s. Yeah. You can buy this. Yeah. You, you, you call this two dimensional nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And we had answers from, from ETH Zurich uh, that Nobel Prize for this. And it works the same way. And you get, get these maps. Yeah, like for spin systems, this is a piece of cake because spin systems are having mostly having decoherence times that are much, much longer than yeah, so many oscillation cycles. They're well isolated, they live for, for microseconds or something. Okay? So you get very sharp and nice resonances. Plus, yeah, uh, for these uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, we're talking gigahertz or uh, so frequencies, so you just take, can take your regular oscilloscope to measure the signals, the traces. Yeah, it's, it's very easy to, uh, uh, yeah, you can buy this off the shelf, uh, super easy. My friend Peter Ham, uh, also in Zurich, by the way, but at the University of Zurich, yeah, uh, um, got famous in his postdoc also a long time back already with Robin Hochstrasser because he did the first experiment to do this at infrared frequencies. Infrared frequencies are sensitive to molecular vibrations, so you can do this, uh, you can use this to get information on structure of proteins and molecules, dynamic information about protein folding, for example, super great technique, yeah? and comparatively easy because infrared frequencies are 10 times longer than visible frequencies. So uh, you don't have these slight experimental problems that your time delays are always wiggling around and that everything is changing in the laboratory. Yeah? So the interferometers are easy to build. Plus there's also optical te techniques for measuring the fields, but in principle the same. Yeah? And in the optical field, this is also known. Yeah? And Graham Fleming's group made a lot of noise about this. Tobias Brixler from, uh, from Wolfsburg uh, did a wonderful post of him where he uh, uh, basically used this for the first time to get information on proteins and uh, yeah, to record such 2D spectra on proteins. Yeah. And Greg Engel got a super nice uh, professor position at the University of Chicago for publishing a nature paper in which he used uh, this two dimensional uh, electronic spectroscopy yeah, uh, to probe how some of these, these peaks here oscillate as a function of this famous waiting time that I introduced past there to relate. To and he saw wiggles, and these wiggles live for a long time. Yeah. And so they concluded that there's wave like motion of electrons in biological systems, and this con uh, created the field of quantum biology which is maybe dead or not, one does not really know. Yeah, um, yeah. because but it created a very strong uh, push towards asking what is the role of quantum coherence in energy materials, in general, photosynthesis, the photovoltaic charge and energy transfer. Yeah. And the original interpretation of the experiment was completely wrong yeah. uh, because they didn't understand what was around the couplings were. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at least uh, brought uh, the, the technique on the market. Yeah. Partly good, partly bad. Yeah. And it also created, it caused, it emphasized two problems that are important. A, the data quality is horrible because defacing properties are defacing short. Yeah. And measurement is complicated, so you ask two different groups to do the same measurement, they will get very different data. Yeah, not good. Yeah. And B, the theoretical interpretation of this, this data is even worse. Yeah. So there's very few people who, get, who share 
the same thought about like how to interpret such a metaphor. Yeah? Two very fundamental problems, which I think we have partly had in overcoming. Yeah? So back to our system of uh, 2D spectroscopy of uh, exciton plasma couplings and stuff that I wanted to talk about. Yeah. So there, there's some first experiments uh, that have been done, uh, but they could not show the Rabi oscillation yet, so we thought it's so a little bit out of the lab. Uh, so what we did in order to, uh, to try to overcome problems, we worked on noise, of course. We tried to suppress noise from the lasers and to have high repetition rate laser system in very short passes so, so as to get uh, uh, nice experimental data that could actually be handled even during corona times yeah, uh, and even in a small uh, village like Goldenburg. Yeah. And uh, since I shorted the theoretically okay. Okay, since I heard that some some of you uh, are doing theory on TNDC, yeah, yeah. just a uh, uh, short teaser, yeah, that, uh, that's a super great technique to learn something about TNDC. Uh, so you probably know more about uh, transition metal like Chalcomenite, excellence than I do. Uh, so we have an atomically thin layer uh, of a semiconductor. Yeah. And in this layer, you can have excitons. Yeah. And these excitons are squeezed into the layer, so they have like pancakes. Yeah. And uh, the nice thing is uh, they have such large exciton binding energy uh, that this is much larger than KP. And uh, you can very nicely see a reflex series of, of exciton states in this material. Yeah. And uh, the other nice thing is that they have been claimed to have a new degree of freedom, which is the value spin degree of freedom, um, yeah, because uh, basically you have a little bit complicated geometric structure here of, for example, homolithium disulfide or tungsten disulfide uh, with basically two degenerate points in, the, in, in, uh, in K space. And now you can use polarization of the light, uh, circular polarization of the light uh, to basically control uh, which of the um, heavy hole to light hole transitions uh, or various light conduction band transitions to drive. And uh, this is something that is peculiar about this. Yeah. And so there's an interest in understanding the interaction between these different um, K states here, and I will just show some results when we just did this. So that's what you see in a typical 2D experiment on such a uh, uh, tungsten disulfide monolayer. Yeah. So you see these two dimensional spectra, and here it's a bit more complicated. It's not really like this textbook example that we have, but you have an A exciton that's the lowest lying exciton in the sample. Yeah. Then, so that's transition from here to here or from here to here in the diagram and then you have a B X plot that's this split off band here which is excited into the conduction band here yeah? and now you can see these two yeah? and you can also ask like how do they interact and how do they couple to each other yeah? you see complicated many body interactions but this is not what I will dwell upon but I just want to show you that if you look at the waiting time dynamics here at the early times, yeah, you see uh, that this is complicated. And if you zoom in, yeah, you see very pronounced high frequency oscillations on top of this. Yeah, and these high frequency oscillations are a sign of a coherent coupling between A and B exons. The two pendula have very different resonance energy, and therefore these oscillations are basically at the decuning frequency that is given by the A and B exons splitting. And so they, are these two different exons are, are these two different states and let's say on one position. I, I comment on this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, at the moment we cannot get that. Yeah. So we know in the moment 
we have done these experiments not yet with polarization result uh, with polarization is resolution. So we can just tell the, the A and B exciton position. Yeah. And the idea is that now there can be two things. Yeah. So either there can be a sort of short range electron exchange coupling within one valley, or there can be uh, long range couplings between two valleys. We cannot distinguish this, but we can say yeah, it is this very strong uh, coupling energy between the two valleys, roughly 30 millivolt is needed to explain this experiment. And thus the valley degree of freedom here needs to be considered carefully yeah, because many body interactions here uh, basically very rapidly lead to a coupling of, of uh, between the two states so that they're not really uh, like good quantum states anymore. And this is what we have dis discovered here. In these experiments that I showed, they're just a few weeks old. We have just, we have done the experiment with linearly polarized the light and therefore we're still talking uh, to both. And we, we, there's still both options there, uh, but we're just in the process of doing this with, with polarized light so that we can distinguish between inter valley and intra valley couple. But just, yeah, so here, yeah, even in such a system, yeah, the thin monolayer with excitons that are very different, very, very far apart energetically, yeah, even since your, your pulses is broad, yeah, you can impossibly excite them and you can exactly see how the energy is exchanging between the two. Okay. Um, now, to the main experiment that I want to show you, like how excitons uh, coupled to plasmons. Yeah? So the experiment, like what we wanted to see was, let's assume uh, who, who does not know what the surface plasma of the atom is. Or who does know. Okay. So, so, okay, very simple. You know what a mirror is. And you can shine light on the mirror and get reflected. Okay? And that's simple because you have three electrons. Yeah? And these three electrons are driven by the light field. Since they're three electrons, they emit light at a certain uh, phase. And uh, there's destructive and constructive interference in the backwards direction. And this gives you your usual in the morning uh, image in front of your mirror, waiting fine. Now let's assume that you break this mirror into pieces. Awesome. You will still have three electrons in there. And now we have shape resonances. There will be certain colors at which uh, these small mirrors can be resonantly excited. You know this from going to church, if you go to church in France. So uh, that's how uh, they stain their windows, uh, by plasmon excitations, by localized plasmon excitations. And now let's assume that you do not have just a small piece of metal, but that you have a grating that you stretch on a gold surface. Yeah? And you know from, from CD, from okay, beyond your age, so from, from grating, yeah, that basically this scatters the momentum of the light wave, yeah? which changes the angle. Now, if you make this grating, Smaller and smaller and smaller. The scattering angle will, will get the diffraction angle will get larger and larger and larger. Yeah. Now, if you make the, the grating subwavelength, so the period between the clips smaller than the wavelength, then you have incoming light. But in principle, in a classical picture, the wave would go into the surface. This does not happen, but it launches sort of like a water wave at the surface. So, for surface does not penetrate. So you have certain resonance yeah, where you can shine light onto such a structured metal. Yeah, and this this largest strong electromagnetic field just this just propagates up like a water. And so here we wanted to see how these evanescent fields, the surface plasma of lego, the fields that are emitted by these shaking electrons here because they're driven by the light field, how they interact with excitons. Yeah? And so we have taken such a stretched surface and we have put 10 nanometers of uh, an organic thin layer on top of this. 
this organic thin film layer contains this extra. And we wanted to see strong coupling. Here, yeah, so that's the, these plasma and collagen fields, the nascent fields at the surface. You can just use them to basically let long, la, yeah, so it's super cool because you can take like, yeah, you can stretch it right onto something, yeah, and, and you can like light propagate. You will not see it because it's an evanescent, right? Yes, so if you look at it from the microscope, you check it completely dark. Yeah. But then you can light it with hundreds of microns or so, transport it real great to some other place. Yeah. Hope is it, yeah. Okay, so that's the plasma. And here uh, we have such a grating. Okay. And so you can see here we just plot the reflectivity of the creating as a function of the incident angle of the light. Uh, so change the incident angle. Uh, and you see where well, metal reflects light, so mostly the reflectivity, the reflectivity is unity, uh, close to. Uh, but at some at some very distinct angle, yeah, your light it does not get reflected anymore, but it eventually gets transport, transferred into heat. Okay? Because it runs away is one of these evanescent fields along the surface, yeah, just propagates away. And that's where you get a dip here. Yeah. So by choosing the incidence angle of the light, you can decide where, like which plasma you want to excite. You, you can tune the, the color of the, uh, the resonance that you excite. And now, as a dexedone, we took a very interesting molecule, which I will not really explain to you, but it's super interesting. By itself, um, yeah. But take a look, yeah. So this this is the chemical structure, yeah. And it looks complicated, yeah. But not so so complicated, because I think even in the back you can see that you can sort of like flip this around around this middle structure here, yeah. So you sort of like can think about it as having a dipole here and a dipole there, but they're flipped inside. So it's a quadrupolar dye. Yeah? And now the, these electronic excitations can basically tunnel couple here through, yeah, through this stuff. And this leads by some miraculous quantum mechanics uh, to the formation of uh, an optical spectrum which contains just one electronic transition and which is not very strongly affected by coupling to phonons. So it's just a very beautiful two-level system. Uh, so it's, a, it's like a Drosophila two-level system yeah, um, with a very sharp resonance. Um, no, I will skip this. Yeah. We can understand um, uh, the molecule itself. Published a few papers about this. I will not talk about this. But I want you to understand what a J aggregate is. And, okay. Let's assume you are these molecules. Okay, yeah, good. So if I excite you with light here, yeah, you will become bright and radiate light. Yeah. But you act as a small dipole, and the, most of the, the electromagnetic field is not coming into the far field, but most is near field, optical near field. Okay, so he sees your optical near field. And she sees your optical near field, and so on and so forth. Yes. And so these molecules are not independent anymore, but if they're sitting close to each other, they form a band. They form the, the electronic energy which is localized within the band, and this forms what is called a jam. It's an aggregated molecule. The near field couplings between all of well, say some 25 or 30 molecules in the sun, they're so strong yeah, that we have a super radial molecule with a super large dipole. Yeah? So all of the dipoles add up to here. Yeah? And we have a super strong antenna in a sense. Yeah? That's why the molecule is interesting. Yeah? So the mutant coupling between neighboring molecules forms yeah, a chain of particles. Okay? And so this exciton, this aggregated exciton in this thin film yeah, 
is basically a particle in a large, large box out of some 25 molecules. Okay? And that's interesting because yeah, now okay, you know particles in a box. Yeah? We have a lower state there, yeah? and then we have a higher lying state and so on. Yeah? And here now, you see the quantum properties of the system. Because in each of these states now, we can just fill one electron in, very much like in a, as in a quantum law. Okay? So after, actually two is the two different spin, but you know it's been for So after exciting this one, optically, I cannot excite the same system anymore. There will be a strong nonlinearity. And we see an extremely strong optical nonlinearity of the exciton simply due to its quantum properties. Because it's a fermionic system, yeah. and yeah, somebody is looking skeptical. Oh, I was thinking, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. again, this this idea with the coupling you understood. Yeah. And this idea with strong near field coupling you also understood. Yeah. No. Yeah, you you know that if you have a dipole. That this dipole can emit light into the particle, that you know. But you also know that there is an optical near field, not the, the, the static electric field around the dipole. Okay? It's not just the Hertz and antenna, because yeah, it, it's just this optical near field that you learn in electrostatic. Yeah? And this is 100 times stronger than the stuff, the field that goes into the particle. Yeah? So if Two dipoles are sitting very close, yeah? they talk to each other via the optical near field. It's not a photon that is transmitted, but it's a virtual photon or a nascent field that is coming there. Yeah? And hence, basically, yeah? so if I were to excite them, the exciton would travel back and forth to the line. Yeah? Okay? Yeah? Is this a dynamical process or like, so this is part of like, it's the single particle physics? It's 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 the eigenstate. Yeah. So yeah. So when we want to optically excite this, yeah, we have to take one electron, yeah, and bring it from the from the homos of the molecule, the highest occupied molecular, like and we have to bring it to the to the lumo, yeah. Okay. But we have one electron. And this one electron in the excited state will now now be delocalized everywhere. Okay, and since Pauli's principle is Pauli's principle, we cannot take put a second one there. So as soon as we try to excite the same system twice, we cannot do it anymore. There's Pauli blocking. Yeah. Now not Pauli blocking of charge trend, charges, but Pauli blocking of X. Okay, and this creates a, a nonlinearity yeah, because now yeah, we need higher energy to excite the system again. So that's very important, and you can very nicely see this again in two-dimensional spectra of just this excitonic system, because along the detection axis, along the excitation axis, you have one peak. You can you excite the exciton, yeah? but now you can either have stimulated emission, or you can excite the system again, but then it's not in the lowest line particle in the box, but in higher lines there. Okay? And that's the characteristics picture. Yeah? So that causes a giant extonic nonlinearity in the system. Okay, maybe this was so this you could also probe with normal uh, bump probe spectroscopy, right? In the sense that you would see an absorption bleach because uh, the uh, like after a certain time delay, there is no absorption possible anymore. Because sure. So here, since you have only one ex yeah, so only one system that you excite, you would moderately not quite uh, get similar information. Yeah. Because uh, that's just the that, yeah, so there's no energy transport or anything going on. Yeah. Good question. Why don't you get a fast? I mean, multiple. Ah, you do. Okay. 
the, the group, yeah. take a look, you see this very clearly, because this is not a peak, yeah? this is extended here. Yeah? But I, I cheated, so I forgot to write that. Yeah, okay, okay. Good. Then I'm fine, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. In a proper well, you, you do get gaps, right? Yeah. Here, here the gap size that is what inversely proportional to the number of functions, I guess. No? no. To the interplay between near the coupling and equivariance. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because now we can also say exactly what the plasma mm -hmm. model is. Yeah. So now we have these excitons here, they're localized already. Yeah. So now the super radiant excitons in the front row, there's also a super radiant exciton in the back row. Yeah. And now the plasma field can cover the two. Yeah. And form a super radiant, super radiant exciton. Okay. Very interesting physics here. Okay, now now we can we can see this, yeah, because now we can look just that linear optics of the coupled system. Yeah? So the slit creating with excitons. Yeah? And you see that now, okay, this was the plasmon resonance before. It was a straight line in angular resolved reflectivity, but it no longer is. Yeah? It splits off, okay? So the characteristic sig signature uh, anti-crossing of, of coupling in linear optics. So you have coupling between excitons and plasma. And no surprise when we saw the data, there was also at the re excitron resonance there was a dip. Yeah, and we thought, okay, no problem. We have excitons that lie outside of the regions of strong fields, so then they don't care. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we thought not particularly surprised. This uh, uh, induced absorption feature, is, if, if this goes to this second state, is that because the phase of these, of these excitons is, 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 has this low plane in the middle, isn't this second state not dark or something like that? The, the Very good question. Again, something that took us only like two or three months to understand. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, uh, these one to two particle transitions are really getting complicated. Basically, what you do is you you, perform, you create two particle state. So so uh, you start in a no exciton state. Okay. So we have different excitons. All of them are in the ground state. Okay. Now you take one of these excitons and bring them to the excited state. Okay. Fine. And now what you do is you uh, need to excite this system again. So you cannot do this by bringing the no exciton to the second excited state because it would be optically dark. But you can have an optically allowed two particle transit excitation. So you go from one exciton, the neighboring dark, to two excitons somewhere in the system. And this then is optically allowed. Mm -hmm. And if it's the two excitons, if this two exciton state is a doubly excited state in the same J, you get exciton resonance, then this is what is giving you the, the resonance. So, but it's this, like, I'm not good in explaining this in simple enough terms or name. No, I will not do this now because otherwise I will lose myself. You you think a little bit harder and you will see yeah? <laughs> many so yeah. Okay. In quantum dot language, you create a biexiton. Yeah. You go to the exiton and then you go to the biexiton, and that's what you do here. It's not a biexiton. It's the the, 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 yeah. the the big one. It's it has to sit in the same segment. It has to sit in the same jaggedy yeah, yeah. because otherwise it won't, no, no, will not it, get. Yeah. It sits in the same, not one molecule, but in, yeah, the in, in this aggregate. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, when you do linear optics, yeah, you have ground stage, 
excitons and plasmons, and they couple, they form polaritons. Yeah? And everything is classical harmonic oscillator physics, yeah? because you cannot tell the difference, yeah? because you don't get uh, higher lying quantum states. Yeah? Now, we take the, we compare this exciton on a planar gold pill to a 2D spectrum of the, this exciton on this gold grating, so that can be coupled to the plasma. Okay? So you see, this was our exciton feature that we started with. Yeah? And you find it again. Yeah? And then you find these small peaks here yeah? that you cannot even see, but you can zoom in again. Yeah? And you, okay, yeah. And you will see that these appear at the polariton resonances. So you see the polaritons that are formed also in the nonlinear spectrum. Yeah? So you see the extra plasma coupling here. Yeah? So very much like what I told you at the beginning, yeah, where I showed this map with the coupled state. But why is this so why is it so weak? You would have seen stronger because of the air field coupling. So this is this J aggregate exciton, this one. Okay. Yeah. So if I assign one of them, also if I assign one, yeah, uh, one out of five will be affected. So the two particle excitation yeah, is strongly confined, is strongly altered with respect to the one particle excitation. Now, when I have the coupling to the polariton, the polariton covers many of these aggregated excitons, and I still make one excitation only, but out of a much more delocalized system, and hence the nonlinearity breaks down. Because you mix the, um, you enhance the coherence length of the excitonic state. So you mix many more excitons to the, to, to the light field. This delocalizes, and this is why it's that's a super great observation. Yeah? And this has to be so. That's a um, signature of coherent delocalization due to the coupling to the residue. And again, yeah? you see there's always this blue red stuff that's ground state reaching the cited state absorption. I have a question. I don't really understand how this could be put to experiment with gold, but the surface plasma polariton mode exists on a gold field irrespective of the presence of the gradient. No. No, that's not. Uh, it cannot be excited in this case because uh, you need, with not with far field light, yeah? uh, so it, you cannot excite the plasma mode. Uh, because it's in a manassian wave and you do not couple to it's an indirect coupling to the rightness of the outcome. But uh, so you can consider it just a mirror to a certain extent. Yeah. So the plasmon does not exist. Yeah. But in this case, for the gold lighting, the plasmon exists, and that's why you see this these new peaks appearing. That's these new polaritons peaks here, that's due to the external plasmon coupling. Plasmon exists, not plasmon. Right, raising that exists, you cannot couple it to parts of the light. Fine. So, because it's a bigger expression, it's just there's coupling to another polarity branch that you don't see it. Um, so, wait, here the exciton is basically the one that you the, the regular molecular exciton. It's unaffected by the presence of the gold. But if you if you shine as long as you shine particle like the plasma also exists but you would never see this. So you don't couple it with this. So it's there, but you just simply don't see this. It's not of, not of no relevance for this specific experiment. 
they do see the other threat because of this much more flexible character. You, you see the exiton here because it's purely excitonic. Yeah? So it's the pure exiton, but not the hybridized state. Yeah. Yeah. So if you do, well, okay, you can also do this dynamically here. So if you probe the dynamics here, you just see an exponential decay, but no oscillation. We we'll show this in this. So here now, so when you when you bring the excitons onto this gold grating, you now open up this channel for exciton plasma coupling. And so when you look at the dynamics of these peaks, you see very strong oscillations. So you see the flow of periodic flow of energy between excitons and plasma. At least that's what we thought in terms of these oscillations of the peak dynamics. Now, very much like what I've tried to explain at the beginning, yeah? Do you get the story completely in the five minutes time? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, so here we see yeah, the, thought, the the signatures in the tidal domain of the Korean energy exchange that we saw it for, this exciton plasma and Rabi oscillation. Yeah. But now, the story gets complicated. We're not completely finished, but I will get you the idea. Now, when you now look at the details of the story, now, because you can now perform these experiments, you can very nicely tune the relative energies by tuning the incident angles, now, and you can repeat this again. Now. And what you see then is that most of most of all these oscillations not simply affect the, the oscillations between excitons in the slits and plasmons on the gradient. But you see that you have to be a bit more careful. And I will try to explain why you have to be careful. Yeah. Because in the real system, you have <coughs> slits in the gold field. These slits carry plasmon excitations, so there will be a high field intensity here. So there will be a strong local electromagnetic field. And there will be excitons that are sitting in these slits. So the dipole coupling between these excitons and these fields will be strong because they're spatially open. Okay? And that's the source of these high of high frequency Rabi oscillations that you see in the linear spectrum. But there are also other types of excitons that are sitting outside of the slits. They're basically dark, but not quite, because the plasma here still persists here. It's just not weak, it's five times weaker. So you actually do not have a simple two coupled oscillator system, but you have three coupled oscillators in the game. Okay? And what then happens is very interesting. Yeah? So basically, like what the plasmon is doing, it is it's transferring the energy between these weakly coupled excitons and the strongly coupled excitons. So it's inducing the long-range quantum transport of energy from excitons between the slits into the slits. And, yeah. So basically, it's like a lambda system in atomic physics. Two states that are close by that coupled to an external resonator, and then there's energy flow between the, the two states without always involving the third. Yeah? And these oscillations between the exotonic subsystem, that's the one that we dominantly see in the time of yeah? So in short, in, yeah, what we have is we've tried to make a bet, so this, to design a model system for exciton plasma coupling. We see the exciton plasma coupling, and we see also other like weakly coupled exotons. Yeah. But as soon as we do the nonlinear experiment, yeah, we see that the quantum dynamics that are underlying this are much more, com more complicated than what we had thought in the beginning. And in particular, they show how the vacuum fields here yeah, can, trans can read space transport of external energy over mesoscopic distance over hundreds of microns at room temperature yeah, with dephasing times in the 100 
And so, to conclude, uh, so uh, yes, we can understand this. We can also do the theory. Uh, I, uh, I don't want to dwell on this. Yeah. So we have performed first study of Rabiot's lesions for for an external system that is strongly coupled with plasma. Yeah. Uh, and we have a method here yeah, to the electronic spectroscopy, uh, which, in my opinion, yeah. It's maybe a bit difficult to understand, but it provides super important information on quantum coherent couplings uh, in, in many body systems. And uh, I think there will be more physics coming out of this. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Christoph, for this very informative talk. And we appreciate it for many of us. Uh, I heard it out and out, and uh, so I learned now much more than the first time I heard it. So it helps to go to, to shock. Are there other questions after all the email asking? We have a few minutes. Yeah. You said that the legs of those J echo decks are connected to the molecules, but you know it's been the molecules, and it always change those. It can be possible to go directions. Uh, here, uh, you can see this basically from uh, the energy, so from um, the shape or from the strength of the linear torsion as opposed to the side uh, state torsion. If, if the box gets very small, then the, this second higher state will shift up a lot, you will see this design shift. If the part of the box size gets very large, the two energies will always be the same, and there will be almost no learning energy. So from the picture there, you can not be guess. You know, it's not that. You can say, it's like 30 molecules, but it cannot be like 200. Yeah. Very. So does the oscillation frequency in this experiment match the splitting that you observe? Some oscillations, yes, but mostly not. Because, like here, here, these excitons, they are at the energy of the uncoupled, yeah, so just at the exciton resonance. And the polariton, so when you bring exciton and plasmon into resonance at this exciton energy, one state will shift down, and the other state will shift up. So basically doubling this, this splitting. The, the oscillations that we see are between the exciton and this lower polariton. Yeah? And this is half the energy, and therefore the oscillations are twice, some of the oscillations, or many of the oscillations, are roughly twice as long as the other oscillations would be. Yeah? Yes, you, so you can sort of count the, the peak distance in the waiting time plot as a measure to to say couples to okay. so we can't let's say Christoph again.